Thank you so much, Namshik, for your uh, short talk uh, about repurposing drugs for COVID, a very topical issue that a lot of our leaders of tomorrow are really interested in. Um, my first question is, could you speak a little bit, little bit more broadly about the overall vision for the Milner Therapeutics Institute oh, yeah. and the work that you're doing there? Sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, as you know, uh, the Miller Institute is an academic institute under the Cambridge University, and uh, we are uh, doing some kind of research for the therapeutics uh, or drug discovery. But uh, we have some slightly different concept than the other research institute under the university, uh, which is uh, we are really looking forward to the open innovation and also uh, doing a lot of translational research. So we do have a, a consortium in the institute that called the Miller Therapeutics Consortium, uh, which is uh, more than 80 uh, organizations under the umbrella. So uh, there are some academic institutions, but also uh, our uh, partners in the industry, for example, uh, GSK AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, like uh, large pharma companies. But also we do have uh, quite many of uh, SMEs in biotech area. Some do AI data science like my group, but some do developing a antibody, some do the cell therapy. So there are so many different types of companies under the same umbrella. So we are really working together, academia to industry, industry to academia, and uh, we really working toward to making a new or better therapeutic uh, targets. So yeah, that's what we do. Fantastic, great, uh, really novel innovation model. Uh, we had a question uh, come through the Slido. Uh, with, given the similarities between the genome of SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, have you applied the study to uh, uh, SARS-CoV? Oh, yeah, uh, that's very, very uh, uh, interesting question. Yes, uh, everybody knows there is a, a lot of sequential similarity and structural similarity, uh, but two different uh, virus having quite different uh, symptoms. So, uh, yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. So we actually are now trying to do this kind of comparison between two, but we haven't finished the full analysis, but that's uh, ongoing uh, analysis in the lab. Great. And another question uh, is, uh, is there a cell uh, specific context to this gene expression profile and drug simulation since defining uh, cell specificity is needed yeah. to prevent undesired effects? Sure. Yeah, that's another very good uh, question and important as well. Uh, so maybe uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, this kind of a lot of effort, really, really incredible effort, to be honest, in, in the history uh, since the lockdown or the pandemic happened. So uh, many scientists work really hard, but uh, I think now it's fine. But when we just face this kind of new disease, everybody kind of in real hurry to make some kind of breakthrough. So at that time, uh, a lot of groups are generating the data, but that's coming out from some different cells because they just want to do, do it quickly. So some data coming out from colon, some data coming out from lung, uh, but I don't think this is not really bad, but I think this is not completely ideal. So if we really wanted to do more uh, cell specific uh, ones, then we need to carefully design the experiment. So what I meant is like, uh, uh, we couldn't get this kind of full, fully controlled or fully managed kind of data per each cell type, but uh, now it's available in the literature. So what I meant is like, we are going to do it, but also uh, there are many groups in also in Cambridge or in somewhere in the UK, they are already uh, applying for funding for this kind of cell type specific experiment. So I, I hope we will have uh, better and uh, more data uh, later this year, and then we can really uh, fully working on cell specific ones. But at the moment, uh, we can't do it because of the data availability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a little bit related to that, but what are the challenges that exists when integrating both proteomic and transcomic data sets? And how can we address these problems? Yes, I think this is really a good question again. Uh, and uh, this is actually one of the things my lab mostly doing, like uh, so-called multi-omics integration. 
Uh, so as you know, multiomics is not only from proteomics and transcriptomics, but there are like uh, metabolomics and also epigenomics and genomics. So uh, this is a kind of million dollar question, like in the end of the day, we want to understand how, what kind of how the genes are expressed and how they are regulated, and then how they can make a protein in a right time and right place, how that happens. So entire mechanism is the kind of question. So uh, now, fortunately, there are a lot of uh, kind of a revolution in the experimental side and a lot of different data is available. That's kind of happy, happy problem. But also, as you asked, this is kind of really important question, how we can properly kind of uh, integrate or properly analyze these kind of quite different data sets for just one question. So uh, actually in the lab, we are using quite many of mathematical modeling or sometimes using machine learning to properly uh, kind of pull together all the information uh, from the beginning. What I meant is like, of course, there is a number of ways like you can analyze proteomics and transcriptomics and some other data type of multiomics and then combine the result at the end to understand the mechanism. But what we're trying to do is like we kind of making mathematical model to put each kind of component in, in the mathematical model from the multiomics data. And then we wanted to uh, more systematically analyze this data. So that's kind of uh, uh, kind of very interesting question. And also we, that's one main area where we are working on. Excellent. So do you have any closing thoughts or uh, ideas that you'd like to share with our young leaders of tomorrow from around the world before we move to the next short talk? Sure, I think, uh, well, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, computational biologist, uh, we always uh, think about the data, but these days is not only us, which is great for us, but also there are many things we need to think about, like what kind of data, what kind of quality, how, how we can make it, and what this kind of data actually tells us. So uh, what I meant is like, we need to think about more carefully when we're making the data, but also in another hand, it also we, it's very important to using how we can using the so-called AI or machine learning. I mean, AI or machine learning is not always needed for all the kind of data sets. Sometimes just simple statistical test is enough or even, is even better uh, than just using machine learning. So I think, there are a lot of uh, kind of advantages of the machine learning, but sometimes we need really thinking about what kind of data is in our hands and hence what kind of analytical tools are needed. So this is kind of very important question too. So yeah, that's kind of piece of advice that I can give. Great, thank you so much. The right tool at the right time, I guess. Yep. Thank you so much uh, for your time, Namshik.